Good morning. Um, yeah, as Adrian said, this morning we're continuing our journey through the Gospel of John. It's one that we started a long time ago, I think back in September of last year. And those, that, uh, last year we looked at the first half, which is about Jesus' life uh, and ministry over a number of years. And this second half is titled The Week That Changed Everything. And it focuses in on that final week leading up to the crucifixion. And this morning, that is where we reach this seminal moment, the crucifixion. And so, in many ways, it seems rather overwhelming to try and draw out some of the key points from this chapter. Although I felt reminded by God as I prepared that all of the Bible is God's living word, and therefore all of it is useful for equipping us and for teaching us, and it is all powerful. That said, the crucifixion is a vital uh, part to the Christian faith. It is central to everything else. Uh, and so, in terms of where we are in the story... Uh, we have had a few chapters of Jesus teaching uh, and then he's been praying with his disciples and then he's come out into the Garden of Gethsemane and he has been uh, betrayed by Judas and then arrested and he's been beaten and ultimately he's been sentenced to death. And that <clears throat> that's where we pick up the story this morning. Um, Pilate has just handed Jesus over to be crucified. So we're going to be reading from uh, John 19 starting at uh, verse 17, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV. It says this. So the soldiers took t charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out of the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Calcotha. They were cru they, there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the law protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The gar this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. <coughs> Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies, so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen. 
This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Yeah, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you poured out your grace in the most horrific of circumstances, that you made a way, Lord. Lord, we ask that you open up your word this morning and help us to grasp something of what was accomplished on that glorious day. Amen. Wow. So this is a, a seminal moment in the course of human history. This is the death of Jesus, the Son of Man, God on earth, has been beaten and he has been killed in the most horrific of ways. And that manner of Jesus' death is really important. It was a very public death. It was done for everyone to see. For those religious leaders that were calling uh, and chanting for Pilate to crucify Jesus, they saw this as an end to this troublesome movement that Jesus was leading. Of a very public death was the ultimate solution. Everyone would see that Jesus had been killed. You could make no mistake, he was dead. It was there for everyone to see. No conspiracy could come after this. After all, they'd handed him over to people that were very good at killing. The Romans did this routinely, uh, and they used crucifixion. Now, this wasn't a one-off just for Jesus. They were very good at crucifixion as well. In fact, he was crucified along with some criminals, it says. But crucifixion was the ultimate form of punishment. It was particularly brutal. The condemned person was nailed or tied to the cross. Uh, and, and perhaps we've seen the images, perhaps we're a little numb to it. But they were hung there in pain until they died. It was shocking. They would die of suffocation or of exposure. It wasn't a quick death. It wasn't a nice death. It was a truly horrendous death. It was slow and painful. And part of it was to act as a deterrent to others who might want to be doing the same sort of thing. Uh, on this occasion, the religious leaders wanted to ensure nobody was going to continue to spread Jesus' message, continue to follow him, because this is what could happen. And it wasn't just a way to kill them, it was a way to humiliate them, to, to degrade them. It was often reserved for, for the lowest members of society, the slaves, the foreigners, those who were considered enemies of the state. This was a public death. The Romans and the religious leaders wanted to extinguish any suggestion that Jesus was going to continue to lead this movement. But Jesus perfectly uses this public nature of his death to make it spectacularly backfire. Ultimately, it has the opposite effect. When Jesus rises again, it is the perfect witness that Jesus has power over death. Everyone had seen him die. And this is not just something we read in the Bible. This is not just something that Christians uh, believe. This all historical evidence points to this as a fact. This is a real thing that happened on earth just outside of Jerusalem. And it's not merely symbolic. Some of the pictures are on the screen show it was just outside of Jerusalem. You could, you could see it. It was very public. Bart Ehrman, who's a, a prominent scholar, but he's a, he's a, a, he's a critical of, of Christianity, he says... Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. It was meant to be. It was done in public. Now, just because Jesus was killed, that didn't mean that he stopped being God. It didn't mean that he stopped having the power to stop it. Just like we read in, in the previous chapter, uh, when Peter draws his sword, he thinks, I'm going to save Jesus here. He draws his sword and starts attacking people. Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And even earlier in this chapter, when Pilate is uh, trying him and he said, don't you know what I could do? Jesus says to him, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus is sovereign throughout this situation. He goes willingly. 
He does this because he loves us. But his sovereignty doesn't lessen the pain. It doesn't lessen the suffering that he endured. And we can look to Jesus' pain and his suffering uh, as one of great strength. A source for us of great strength. That Jesus understands when we're walking through painful things. He suffered the ultimate humiliation, the ultimate pain. We may seek comfort in him as one that has gone through horrific circumstances. That's really powerful. God is not distant. He's not remote. He didn't create the earth and then go, oh, good luck with that. He is with us. He cares for us. He understands us. I work for a manufacturing firm. <clears throat> and uh, a few years ago now, I had a boss who bought about a quarter of a million pounds worth of material, um, which is a lot of money for our business. Um, but it was only for one customer. It just seemed like a good deal at the time, I suppose. Uh, and I, so we assumed we'd have this customer for years. And as you can imagine, very shortly after we bought all this material, uh, we lost the customer. And so we had all this raw material in stock, loads of it, aisles and aisles of this stuff. And when people would ask, why have we got all that stuff? My boss didn't say, oh, well, yeah, I don't really know. I can't really remember what happened there. He would publicly say, yeah, that was, that was me. I did that. I, I made that mistake. And the effect was profound. Myself and others, we, we weren't worried about making a mistake anymore. We, we were happy, if we did make a mistake, to go to my boss and say, look, we, we've messed up. Because we knew that he understood. Now, Jesus didn't make a mistake, but he did suffer in a way that we may seek refuge in him. That when we're suffering, through him, we can endure. And not only does this public death serve as a witness to the power that Jesus has over death, the public suffering and humiliation was one that fulfilled a number of prophecies that were foretold about the Messiah, the one that was going to redeem humanity. It said that he would suffer and die in this manner. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 22, 16, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. <coughs> Zechariah 12, 10, They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. These fulfillments demonstrate that Jesus is who he says he is. He is God, the Son of Man, the foretold Messiah. And not only through action and prophecy was Jesus confirmed as the truth, it was publicly declared in writing. Part of that crucifixion process is to hang a sign that identifies the person, identifies their crime. Uh, again, it's useful if it's going to be a deterrent, you know what not to do. Um, and as we uh, saw in the last couple of chapters, when Pilate trials Jesus, Pilate concludes that Jesus is innocent. He has done no, nothing wrong to deserve this crucifixion. He couldn't identify any crime. So in verse 19, it says, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It says the religious leader said, no, no, don't put that. Put that he said that I'm the King of the Jews. Pilate writes, I've, says, I have written what I have written. Again, this demonstrates Jesus' authority over this situation. Even on the sign of his crucifixion, the truth is declared. This is a title that Jesus has held throughout his life. Uh, the wise men, when they came to see him in Matthew 2.2, 2, says, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? And this title was written in three languages. It says, many of the Jews read, read this sign. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. This is for everyone. Jesus died for us all. The crucifixion is a public death. Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice willingly 
And it's the only way that we can be reconciled with God. The public nature of, of Jesus' death was deliberate and, and testifies to who he is. But Jesus also spoke while he was on the cross. And through his words, we can see what he came to do. It is the conclusion of his ministry. It is not a public defeat. It is, in fact, a public triumphant and glorious victory. Verse 30 says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Just before we look at what was meant by it is finished, uh, I just want to look at why John is recording these words, it is finished. In other Gospels, we read that Jesus says other things on the cross. Uh, we read, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Famously uh, echoing Psalm 22. And he also says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now all these things were uh, phrases that Jesus spoke while on the cross. Simply put, I think we find seven different recorded phrases uh, that Jesus says while he's up there. And they were all up there. He did say all these things. So why is it that dis different gospel writers are highlighting different phrases? And I suppose more specifically to this morning, why is John highlighting Jesus saying, it is finished? Well, clearly we have four different gospels for a reason. If, we, if they were for the same purpose, we would only have one. They provide different perspectives. Each of the four gospels were written by a different author, and they have different audiences in mind and different purposes. Matthew primarily wrote to the Jewish audience and he focuses uh, on Jesus' role as the Messiah. Mark was written primarily for a Roman audience and he likes the action and does a lot of what Jesus acts. Luke was very methodical, written primarily for Gentile audience and uh, those that, that weren't Jews and emphasizes Jesus' compassion and love for the Gentiles, those not Jewish. Well, John is an eyewitness. He emphasizes Jesus' divine nature, that Jesus is the eternal God who became man. Uh, and so all the Gospels have a unique perspective, and together they offer a, a much more complete picture of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death and resurrection. And so each of the Gospels uh, record different stories. They have different teachings and, and the details complement and enrich each other. This is to be expected. If you, if you I like football, if, if we went and watched a football match and our four different people, what happened, what was the key moments, you'd get different answers. Same as if you watched a film, what happened in that film, you would get different answers. It's not to say they're wrong, they're just giving a different perspective. So why is it that John has recorded, it is finished? How does that serve to communicate the main purposes of John's gospel? In fact, read at the end of John's gospel, uh, in chapter 20, verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John records here, it is finished, the, the word in Greek is tedelestai, uh, and that translates as it is finished or, or it is accomplished. And it comes from the Greek root uh, to bring to an end, to complete. So Jesus is completing something. He is completing his mission to redeem humanity through his death. By saying this, he is declaring that his work of salvation was finished. He has fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah, and that if we follow Jesus, if we believe in him, that he bore the weight of our sins, that the death that was due us, we can have life in his name. It represents the completion of God's plan of salvation for humanity through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It's a stark reminder that the punishment for sin is death. And that we cannot earn our salvation through our own efforts. But that it's a free gift from God. 
of God's grace for all those who believe in Jesus as their Lord. We ourselves do not finish anything. It is only Jesus who finishes it. And Jesus does not say, I've finished part of it. It's, you know, it's, it's almost done. Jesus, as God, has the authority to declare it is finished. We can only have life through Jesus' name, through the truth of who Jesus is. He came and bore the weight of our sin. Nothing we could achieve ourselves. But Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And John 3, 15, That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. We can be no longer dead in our sin, slaves to our sin. We can be free and alive in Jesus. That unbreakable bondage of our sin with no way to righteousness is finished. There is now a way, and his name is Jesus. We can have new life. We can have an eternal salvation. The old is finished. So although it's finished, uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy, the taking on of our sins, the story is not finished and it does not end there. We are still able to turn to Jesus, to put our faith in him. The time to follow Jesus is not finished. And one such character in this passage we see do just that is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a really interesting character that pops up now and again in John's Gospel. Uh, and we, we first see Nicodemus back in John 3. He was a member of the, the Sanhedrin. That's those are the, the ruling council of the Jewish people. Uh, and he comes to Jesus to, to understand more about his teaching. But he comes at night. Uh, and they have a great back and forth. And Jesus tells him, in order to see the kingdom of God, he must be born again. Nicodemus misunderstands this initially, thinks he's got to uh, go into his mother's womb for a second time. But Jesus explains that this is a spiritual rebirth, not a physical one. And this morning, again, we see Nicodemus in this passage. And this time he's an accompanying, accompanying Joseph. It says, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. So it's possible that Nicodemus' devotion to, to Jesus was not public knowledge at this point. After all, he came at night under the cover of darkness initially. But here, he is not hiding. They are taking the body of Jesus for burial. This was a public declaration of their allegiance. And it would have had significant implications uh, in the Jewish community. <laughs> they would have had a loss of reputation, of course. They've just come out in support of someone who is recently crucified, the supposed criminal. And not only that, by handling Jesus' dead body, they were making themselves unclean for the Passover celebration. But despite all these uh, awful possible consequences, Nicodemus steps forward and he does the loving work of the burial preparation. Something typically would be done by the closest of family members. He was openly identifying himself as a disciple of Jesus, along with Joseph. And in doing this, another two influential, respected men provide a perfect witness to the early disciples that Jesus had died. We took his body, we laid it in a tomb. He was definitely dead. So by accepting that free gift of Jesus on the cross and submitting our lives to Jesus, that frees us from our bondage to sin. It allows us to have that spiritual rebirth that Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus. It's hard to, to overestimate the importance of what happened on the cross. On the cross, Jesus dealt with my sin, <clears throat> cancels my indebtedness, and frees me to live. It is finished. I love the way it's put in, in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. It says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. 
He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I love that. Triumphing over them. He made a public spectacle of them. And this morning, we're so fortunate to be able to share in baptisms. Who, people like Nicodemus who are putting their faith in Jesus. They have on, undergone a spiritual rebirth and now are publicly declaring their faith. And Christianity is a public faith. Jesus died a very public death. And he publicly declared, it is finished. Yet, it is often a hard part of our faith, we find. <coughs> the fear of what others will think. We even saw that with, with Joseph of Arimathea. He was worried about what others would think. But when we accept that Jesus died for us on the cross, took on our sin that was due us, that affects every part of our life. And it naturally becomes public. Jesus calls us to be a light. In Matthew 5, it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people like light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I was recently encouraged by my six-year-old son. We can be encouraged by all sorts of people. Uh, he saw his friend hurt at school. Uh, he injured himself and then ended up fainting. Uh, and he brought his friends together and said, let's pray for him. Wow. That was all he could do. And not only was it all he could do, he knew it was useful. He knew it was powerful. And as a child, he had no reservations about publicly showing uh, his belief. It was simply a natural reaction to his personal convictions. Our public persona is a reflection of our private persona. So if this morning uh, you aren't a Christian, this free gift is for you. The gift of the cross. Wherever you are on Nicodemus' journey, whether you're curious about understanding more about what Jesus taught, I encourage you, talk to someone, ask questions. Perhaps you're ready to accept, accept the gift of the cross. And I would encourage you again to find someone, pray with them. Make that declaration. And for those of us who know Jesus as our Saviour, how do we live in this truth uh, of what Jesus accomplished on the cross? How do we be a light of this world? Well, Jesus teaches uh, that a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So to be a public light, let's fill our hearts with good things. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So how do we do that? Well, we, we can set good habits. Spend time in prayer. Read, meditate on his word. We can worship him. We can serve to further his kingdom. We can rest in his presence. When we have our hearts right, uh, and when we accept the truth of the cross, follow Jesus and pursue the things that he has for us, he will use us as a bright light. Matthew 5 doesn't say, force your light to shine. It says it cannot be hidden. It says, let your light shine. As the classic school hymn pleads, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. It is about Jesus. Pursue Jesus and let him give you the oil to keep you burning. And when the opportunities come to share the transformational nature of the gospel, simply let the mouth speak what the heart is full of. The good news of the cross. 
the, the band are going to come back up, but I'll just, just end in prayer. Yeah, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the good news uh, of what you did on that day, Lord. It was a real day on this earth, Lord, and we just thank you that you came as man and you died for our sins. Lord, what was due us, you took on. Willingly, you took it on, Lord. And thank you that we now have a way to have a relationship with you, Lord. Lord, help us to set good habits, to spend time with you, Lord, uh, and to just pursue you daily and use us uh, to let your light shine. Yes. Amen.